and Darcy and I are going to anchor a conversation mm -hmm. with you, Greg, um, but that if you want to take it away without us, that's fine by us. <laughs> um, so you have been spending the year in pretty folio-invested ways. I wonder whether you could tell us what you've been up to. I uh, certainly. Um, I decided that I would, um, well, I, I, I realized that every folio has, as you so clearly and beautifully said um, earlier, Judith, uh, every folio has a story to tell because of the evidence of 400 years of readership on those copies. Uh, our own copy in Stratford has a particular story to tell, which I'll tell you in a moment. Um, and I, I kind of went, well, then I really want to know where they are and, and, and who looks after them and what the people who look after them sh you know, share, how they share it with, with their community, if you like. Um, and I, I, my sister said to me, so you're going, let me get this right, you're going to travel around trying to see more than 200 copies of the same book. <laughs> uh, and I said, well, I guess that is sort of right, yes. Um, so it, it, it has taken me um, all over the world, I, by, by, by mistake, weirdly, in that I just got invited to various places. I, I was invited by the British Council to Japan. They said, where else are you thinking of going? And I said, well, I have no idea how I'll ever get to see the ones in Auckland and Sydney. And they said, we'll take you. So uh, I said, yes. Um, and I, I, I went to, back to Cape Town to look at the Cape Town copy. Uh, and did, uh, then I got serious with it and thought, well, I better do this systematically. So in September of this year, I decided I would travel from Toronto to Texas and in 35 days saw 40 folios. So by the end of the year, Folger allowing, um, I should have seen 200 copies of the first folio. Yes, completely mad. <laughs> Crazy thing. Um, but it has been very, very uh, stimulating and, and, and revealing and, and interesting. So I, I brought some of my uh, snapshots along. Uh, this is a surprising one, maybe, to start with. But this is, this is Dorothy Thewton in a snowball hat uh, returning from a trip to Rome. So in 1964, the uh, RSC were invited to Rome. Rome had decided, the Vatican had decided, that it should um, get in on the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's birth and the global celebration. So uh, a three actors uh, were, were sent over from Stratford um, uh, to do a, a series of extracts from the plays. Um, and uh, they decided for some reason that they would also send our first folio along. I don't know who decided that, because it seems to me the Pope doesn't get a great press in this book. Um, <laughs> had nobody read King John, you know? <laughs> um, but nevertheless, that's what happened. And we, they, they took, um, they took the, well, the guy who, who took the folio had to take it in a briefcase wrapped in brown paper, uh, chained to his wrist, and he had to go on a train, uh, whereas the actors flew. The idea being that if, you, uh, if the plane crashed, you'd lose your folio, but if the train crashed, you would probably keep the folio. We'd have a dead man chained to it, but you know, <laughs> that would be a better, a preferable. So that's what happened. Uh, they went to Rome. Uh, they were it, it happened to coincide, the Quatus Centenary happened to coincide with the, uh, the, um, the Second Vatican Council, which was the Catholic Church's initiative to modernize the Catholic Church. Uh, and it was uh, therefore Pope Paul VI and the entire College of Cardinals from around the globe had assembled in the Palazzo Pio uh, in, in, in the Vatican uh, to uh, discuss uh, the issues of the, of the Catholic Church. And as a bit of a light entertainment, the RSC would perform these extracts from, from Shakespeare. All went very well. Um, and at the end of the performance, the Pope, who, Pope who was sitting in the aisle, enthroned in the aisle, uh, they processed up the aisle to, 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 to meet the Pope, and Dorothy Tutin beautifully uh, held up our folio uh, to be blessed. 
um, you can see what's happening, don't you? <laughs> and unfortunately, His Holiness misunderstood the gesture and said, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and handed it to a waiting cardinal. And it was literally on its way to the Vatican vaults um, uh, until a, a, a swift bit of impl it, diplomatic intervention prevented an international incident. So Dorothy arrives back in <laughs> the Air London airport in her snowball hat and spills the beans about the Pope nearly stealing our coffee off the phone, yeah. uh, which the Vatican then, I have to tell you, deny. <laughs> um, so that was the story of, of, of that one. And I realized there were just, that every folio in some way had some kind of story to tell. Um, if, and, uh, and ours happens to be one of the best. Thank you. Perhaps we can just stay with the, the Royal Shakespeare Company copy for a moment, but I know that many of you, as I have, will have spent uh, many an extraordinary evening in the theatre uh, enjoying productions that you have directed and that sometimes others in your team have directed in Stratford. But I know that the folio, that particular copy of the folio, some, some folios are treated with a kind of a sacrosanct kind of reverential respect. You don't treat your copy that way. What do you do with it? We don't. We don't. I, you know, I, to me, it's a working copy for actors. I mean, there are lots of, you know, there are lots of brilliant digitized facsimiles as the one you have showed there. But there's nothing quite like the folio itself. It's sort of radioactive. And I know that however cynical actors might be beforehand, once they get in the presence of that book, and also... I don't know, it just, it's because that kind of proximity has something very special and emotional about it. And I, and I, and I think, you know, I think Darcy as an actor would immediately respond to that. The sense of, that there, you know, after the folios, you get a lot of editorial intervention uh, and a lot of people are deciding what actually the folio is, uh, means. But here, even though there are massive mistakes in it and you know, there, are, there are clearly errors in it, it's as close as we're going to get to how Shakespeare thought and wrote. Um, and that is really exciting. Um, I, I just did Cymbeline and I had, I'd been fairly wary of the folio, I have to say. Not, well, for one particular bit, there's, people talk about the particular capitalizations in the folio, that there are words that are capitalized that then editors take out. The first line of Cymbeline uh, really sets the tone of sort of edginess in the court. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful evocative line. The first gentleman says, you do not meet a man but frowns. And the F has been capitalized in the folio. You do not meet a man but frowns. And it makes the actor go, oh, that's the important word. Uh, and it also sets the tone for the whole of that first scene. There's a moment where the, the hero, Posthumus, is father. We hear a backstory of his life. And before Posthumus was born, uh, his father uh, died of grief because of, he lost two sons in the war. And the line is, uh, he quit being. And the capital B is capitalized. He didn't quit living, he didn't quit life, he quit being. And I found myself going, wait a minute, this folio's got a lot more, <laughs> right at the end of doing entire folio, I now realize the folio's got an awful lot more to tell me than I thought it had. So, yeah. That's me. And, and what about the the binding as well. So there's so much happening in the content of folios, but what about the binding? So I particularly want to ask about um, the Boston version, which was unbound, yes. and that was for it to be digitized. What do you think they should do with it if it's going to be rebound? So this is a really interesting... On my tour around, you, uh, Judith has mentioned the, the, the copy that was stolen um, uh, in, from Durham. Uh, that is, that is, that had its its bindings ripped off. I mean, it was brutalized. Um, you know, the, the cover was was moved, and the and the, and the binding was lost. Um, they are now doing a research project, really carefully thinking through how they what they do with that copy. 
uh, and it's a unique position. Um, that's, that's, that's me and Emma looking at it. Um, um, that I then discovered at Brandeis University, which is outside, which is near Boston, um, that they have a copy which was disbound, i.e. deliberately unbound, in 1998 in order to have it digitized. And then for some reason they couldn't rebind it, or they left it unbound because they probably didn't have the money for it. Um, as a result of, of this year, I think, they are now thinking, wait a minute, this is an amazing opportunity. What book binder do you know that's had, had the possibility of binding a first folio? And I felt in the, all the copies that I've seen, they are the reverence that you're talking about that they're often treated with, and sometimes the way that the book is fetishized. Um, I would like to see a copy that's not a 19th century Zanesdorf or Riviere or Bedford binding that belongs on the, the august shelves of some aristocratic library. I would like to see a copy that makes it look less like a Bible and more like a book of magic, yeah. um, because that's ultimately what it, what it is. Mm. So, um, yeah, so let me, let me show you some of the things I found. So in Edinburgh, uh, here is the, the Drusout engraving, and if you look very close, uh, he's come as Quasimodo, hasn't he? I mean, it's, it's, um, it's like the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, and what has happened is that somebody has stabbed Shakespeare in the eye and then put a little patch over it and try, talk about out vile jelly. Um, somebody's put a patch over the eye and then not very well tried to kind of cover it up. So. I, I, I think that's just one of the, those great ones. Give me another of the three. <laughs> this, on the other hand, I find really evocative. It, it, it appears in uh, a, a, a folio at Eton, and it, it's, the folio has been um, added to with lots of illustrations at the back of the people who were in the plays, not of production pictures or artists' impressions of plays, uh, and this picture appears with no um, explanation at all. So we don't know what it is. We think, we think it's somebody trying to reproduce the engraving, getting so far and then kind of going, oh, well, I made a mess of that. Um, you can see there in the shadows on the face that there is um, the, 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 the moustache and the eyes are there. Um, what we're left with, however, when you step back and try stopping trying to explain it, is something that I find very um, moving, because it's Shakespeare without a face. Because in my view, we all put our faces in that place. We all create Shakespeare in our own image. I certainly do. We find in Shakespeare what we love. And there are times in Shakespeare where I go, uh, not sure about that bit. And I, I conveniently leave that bit out because that doesn't fit with the Shakespeare I want. And I think people have done that over the ages. So I found that particularly um, moving. This, on the other hand, is a brilliant um, cover for a uh, copy um, uh, of the sonnets translated into Maori. So it, um, it is a copy that I saw in, in Auckland, in, in New Zealand, and very proudly, they, they, had, they had produced this brilliant version of the Drew South engraving. Um, let's have another one. And this has to be my favorite page. It would be for any actor, uh, any Darcy. Um, uh, it's, it's not only the principal actors in all these plays that Jodie's has just shown us. Somebody has annotated it. And they've annotated it right at the top. It, under William Shakespeare, it says, well, we think it says, either leased or ceased for making, which may mean that whoever is writing this, remember, the folio is published seven years after his death, it may be that the reputation of William Shakespeare was leased for making, I don't know. Under Richard Burbage, it seems to say, by report. So this is owned by somebody who is a breath away from seeing Shakespeare and Burbage on the stage. 
further down under William Sly, you can't quite see it here on this copy, but under John Lowen, who um, we know took over Falstaff, for instance, we know he played Hen uh, uh, Henry VIII. Under John Lowen, it says, by eyewitness. You get onto the other line, and, and um, Joseph Taylor, but as, as, as um, Judith was pointing out, is the second Hamlet. It says, no, K-N-O-W, and under Robert Bentham, no, under, under William Eccleston. So too, a little. So this is owned by somebody who knew the King's men, who kind of popped round the dirty duck after the show and kind of got to, 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 to connect with them. And is so excited he writes them down, <laughs> or she writes them down in, in, in that copy. I, I, that takes me straight into the, the tiring house at the Globe. I find that very, very moving as a, as a piece. So part, part of the excitement for you about encountering the individual volumes is using that as the conduit to the person who held that volume or the person yeah. who put an ink mark on it. Yeah. And that, uh, I wonder if you could tell us what this curiosity is. Yes. So I visited Washington um, and uh, Georgetown University. Now, um, Georgetown were very surprised to see me in Washington because they said, well, nobody ever comes to see our folio because they usually come to see the 82 or 3 or whatever it is at the Folger. But the Folger is currently closed for redevelopment and, and will open in the spring. So, um, therefore, I was coming to see the, the, the Georgetown copy and they let me sit and work my way through it. And when I got to the end of The Merchant of Venice, there's this odd um, blot. It's an ink blot. And it's actually where, oddly, in, uh, sometimes the, the final full stop is placed at the top of the letter rather than at the bottom of the letter. So this is a little ink, ink blot. And I look at the sort of strange little semicircles around it. And I've seen those before in other copies. They are where a printer's eyelash or beard scratching has fallen onto the page while the ink was still wet. Um, and I thought, well, that's, I, but what, that's what that is, but what is this? And the librarian came over with a magnifying glass, and we looked at this together, particularly this strange curl, and suddenly he went, and it moved. It's a curly cue of blonde hair that has been in that ink blot from the Jaggard's workshop since 1623. And if anything takes you back in time like that, that weird little ink blot is it. And what, what I love is that maybe if it had been at the Folger and been a really heavily examined copy, somebody would at some point have gone, and got rid of that, uh, of that evidence, if you like. So they could actually do DNA <laughs> sampling on that and, and find out a bit more about the, uh, about the, <laughs> about the printer. As a matter of fact. Uh, this, often the annotations really make me laugh. So I was about to do Cymbeline and went to see a copy at the v &A, And I don't know whether you can read that, but at the top somebody's put, not Shakespeare's, uh, not any part of it. <laughs> and you go, oh well. Sorry about that, but um, I, I'm afraid I disagree. Um, and I think you were mentioning, uh, uh, Judith, about Cymbeline being at the end and being oddly categorized as a tragedy. I think it's such an extraordinary play now. Uh, I believe that they simply didn't know how to categorize it. And if Hemmings and Condor are responsible for that list, I think they went, is it tra it's, it's very funny. That last scene is one of the funniest things in Shakespeare I have ever come across or directed. Um, so it, it, may, it may be that what Shakespeare is doing is kind of bursting the barriers, you know, pushing the envelope and trying to see uh, how far he can take the genre, if you, if you like. So that was just one of the many um, funny uh, annotations. What's the note? Okay. So we heard the story. <laughs> we heard the story, the rather tragic story of the Durham theft. Uh, there's another theft. And this is, the, this is the story 
of the Williams College uh, folio in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And in 1940, uh, an English professor arrived in the college with a letter, a credential, you know, a letter of, of credentials, um, and uh, he basically went to have a look at their first folio. They allowed him to see the first folio. They left him with it, um, and he was English, and he was a professor. So, what could go wrong? Um, and uh, half an hour later, he walked out with his briefcase and his raincoat and um, said, to, said to the librarian, I'm just going to get my wife, she's really got to see this, um, and then didn't uh, appear. So eventually the librarian went back to the folio, which had been placed back in its slipcase, and they went, wait a minute, something's wrong here, took out the book, and it was a sawn down copy of Reynard the Fox. <laughs> and basically he had it walked away with the folio under his arm. Um, and these are the men, uh, because it was found and brought back, these are a group of hoodlums who look as though they're straight out of a really bad production of Guys and Dolls. <laughs> um, these are a, set of, a, a syndicate of Polish gangsters from Buffalo uh, who had uh, hired the so-called English professor, who turned out to be a shoe salesman, and a rather camp shoe salesman, so they thought, that's okay, he'll, be, he'll get away as being an English professor. Um, and they, they, he was, this shoe salesman um, found himself in a bar uh, in Albany a few nights later, uh, not having been paid by the Polish syndicate, and spilt the beans and started bragging about he'd, how he'd stolen the first folio. Um, and uh, found himself talking to a policeman shortly afterwards. Um, and, the, and the folio was returned. So that, that's a rather joyful version of the, the, the theft story. We're, we're going to pick up uh, another image or two in a moment, but um, I'm going to interrupt at this point to, to uh, ask you a sort of meta question about the project. Yeah. So you are absolutely a man of the theatre. You have spent the entirety of your uh, working life and then some making extraordinary works of theatre and giving them to audiences and inviting audiences to, to make of them what they will and that I personally have benefited from that and I'm sure many others here have as well. And now you've set yourself this peripatetic, slightly eccentric, um, archivally detailed, let's get the magnifying glass out in order to look at the hair that might have come out of a man's beard in the early 17th century. Uh, it's, it's not a normal director kind of project, or at least it's not a normal project for a director, um, how is this then coming back into your thinking about playmaking? That's a very good question, and you do make it sound as ridiculous as it is. <laughs> um, I, I will be honest and say it is probably a massive piece of displacement activity, um, in that it, it came at a, you know, I started this at a time when, A, yes, it was this extraordinary 400th anniversary. I'd stepped down from the ROC. I had lost my husband. And I was stepping away from Stratford. And in a way, I was reconnecting. And what, what I found extraordinary about that was, you know, I never thought I will travel in order to discover what my place in the world is and what I'll do next. But there were moments when the two things really connected. And one of those was in Auckland uh, when I was invited to see a production of King Lear by the Auckland Theatre Company. Terrific show, uh, very diverse cast, really contemporary um, account of the play. And because of the death of, of Tony and because one of the last things we did together was King Lear, the line I was not, <laughs> not looking forward to was when Lear at the end of the play says, thou come no more to Cordelia, thou come no more, never, 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 never. And when I directed it, I realized that I had never quite understood why Lear repeats never five times. And now I know, because it's the attempt to articulate and sort of understand what what that grief is about, what loss is about. 
So, um, so we're, I'm watching the show. I'm the guest of honor, and they've decided that it's going to be, though it's a proscenium arch show, they're going to turn it into Travis by putting seats on the stage. And so there's a rank of seats on the stage. And guess who is in the middle of the front row? The guest of honor. And it gets to the last act, and I think, I'm not going to be able to bear this. And we'll get to that line, and I will start howling. And um, suddenly, it was the end of the play. And I thought, I, I must have zoned out. I must have literally shut off. Um, party afterwards, meet King Lear, wonderful actor. Um, he kind of says, oh, I was very nervous. Invites me to brunch the following morning and says, you must have known that I missed out one of the most famous lines <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, which, which is, it, it was extraordinary. Um, and I said to, so I, I said to him, well, to, to be really honest with you, I was very grateful <laughs> because there were times when Shakespeare is too hard and too close and too, too real um, for you just to take it lightly, etc. cetera. Um, and one of the interesting things was that that day I had seen the Auckland copy and we had been laughing at one of the extraordinary, um, the, this, this first folio makes me laugh a lot because it is a rubbish bit of printing. I mean, it's a really scrappy bit of printing. It, it, Hamlet at one point, we know it's a long play, but in, this, in the first folio, it goes from page 157 to page 156 to page 257. Um, there, there are really bad mistakes in it, really terrible bits of pagination. Right at the end of Symbody, it goes uh, uh, 397, 398, 993. Um, so th I love that. But I love it because it's so human and they've got pressure on and they're making mistakes. And one of the best uh, mistakes for me <coughs> is we know the compositor's name. There were several compositors. And this compositor was an apprentice, so he's probably about 17. And he's the only compositor we know his name. His name was John Leeson, and he was rubbish. Um, and at the end of, as Lear says, that very line, the stage direction he has in his copy goes, capital H, Edis. And then in other folios, he's tried again, and he's got H-E, Dis, D-I-S. And then finally gets it right, he goes, H-E dies. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love that. And so we've been laughing about that very line that morning. So the two things came, coalesced together at that, at that moment. Thank you. Yeah. And Greg, you speak about connectivity and the folio is helping you connect and reconnect, which I think is really powerful. I just wanted to ask what you think could be done for accessibility and helping different people see the folios. I know AG and Leicester this year had the project in Birmingham where they took it to schools and yeah. prisons, and it's great that we've got it in the Western Library. What, what else do you think could be happening? Well, you know, there have been so many really interesting uh, pro uh, um, projects this, this year. The Birmingham copy is a very interesting copy because it was bought in, by George Dawson in the late, in the 1870s, and uh, not just by George Dawson, but by, by the team at Birmingham, for the city of Birmingham. Mm -hmm. So it belongs to the people of Birmingham. And you and Fernie um, really got together a fantastic initiative to go and go, Birmingham, this is your copy of the folio, and, took, and has taken it out around Birmingham, which was fantastic. On, to contrast with that, there is a copy in Dallas, in Texas, um, in which I went to, to see that. I was at the end of my folio roadshow, and they keep that in a very modern 1970s brutalist um, library. It's one of the biggest in the States. Um, and they built on the top floor in the rare books department a chapel. And you go into this darkened room through these iron, literally wrought iron gates. And it's lined with English oak linen fold paneling. And at the altar end, <laughs> under little flickering candle bulbs, is the first folio under glass and you cannot get anywhere near it. Um, of course you can't, you know, everybody can't have access to a 400-year-old book, 
But I think it's important that you know, we, we acknowledge that it's not just the item itself. Um, it is, it's a real working document uh, and you know, pe people, have, uh, people should have access to it, I, I think, and be able to get as close to it as they can. Of course, there, you've got to pack that around with, with other things. But to me, there is the physical object itself, as I say, has, has, is radioactive. And, and going into the chapel then, there must have been some crazy adventures of sort of the physical realisation of you're entering a chapel, but then in other places in the library. Could you just speak about the process of actually seeing those books as well? Yeah, well, the, I mean, I, I am very lucky. I mean, I, I wasn't just, can I see your first folio, please? I was. I'm the Artistic Director Emeritus of the Royal Shakespeare Company. I have directed every play in this book. <laughs> Could I have a look at it, please? Yes, go ahead. Um, so I know that. Um, but they, uh, what has been really interesting is just how, the, how many, I mean, many of them are in colleges and libraries and universities, and many of those are really rigorous about the way that they give access to their students uh, in a really kind of um, visceral way, I would say. And I, I think that is really, it's, that's really, really exciting that they can do that. Have another, sure. So in terms, <laughs> in terms of the things that people have, you, that, so for the first two centuries of, it, of its life, this wasn't a sort of sacred book, uh, or a very valuable book, as, as Judith's very useful um, loaves and fishes um, list t t told us. Uh, so people scribble in it. Um, they, and, and this is in the copy of the British Library. It's a little child's drawing, um, and he's got a Caroline collar and maybe a gorget under that. And, and it's in the similar sort of portrait to the Shakespeare drew that engraving itself. Um, but I, I love the fact that just some kid has doodled in, in it. I, I don't know what their parents thought afterwards. Maybe they thought, oh, that's a really good drawing, well done. Um, on the other hand, that said the fingers on. On the other side, he's drawn a cannon next to the word thinnest, and then just behind the cannon, well, I think I know what that is. Um, he has managed to draw a, a, a cock and ball. Anyway. Um, <laughs> There we go. Go and have a look at it in the British Library. Um, many times you get, as, 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 as Judith was pointing out, people are commonplace. They have, they've drawn these wonderful little manicules, these little hands, against lines that they particularly want to remember or use in a sermon. Bless you. Um, and uh, somebody has written, this is in our copy in Stratford, and this is Amelia's lines from, from Othello when she's talking to Desdemona about Othello's behavior. And she says, "'Tis not a year or two shows as a man, they're all but stomachs, and we all but food. They, they um, eat us hungrily, and when they are full, they belch us. And somebody's gone, yeah. <laughs> Exactly right, Shakespeare. I don't know who, what the sex of, or gender of that person was. Here's a really so that people people stick things in as well. And and this is a, a copy in Toronto, which um, comes in Cymbeline. So I was very interested to, to see that. And they say it's a rosebud. Somebody has put a rosebud in it and left it there, and, and that's what it that's what it is. I immediately looked at it and went, that's a scorpion's tail, isn't it? And then I looked at the word it's pointing to. Was a scorpion in his sight? Can't do anything with that other than tell you. Um, but I like that. Here's another copy in, in New York Public Library. Can you see the faint outline of a rusty pair of scissors? And somebody has clearly, at some point, left their scissors and then gone, where the hell did I leave those scissors? Um, well, we've all done that. And Greg, how did you come across these things? Were you sort of going page by page, or did you try and open and find it? Um, Eric Ras, well, um, Sidney Lee wrote this catalogue in 1902 of all the extant folios they knew in the world. And then uh, in 2003, Anthony James West started a similar catalogue to, to the recatalogue. He found uh, one in Skipton that we were talking about. Um, and um, Eric Rasmussen then did a similar catalog you know, absorbing Anthony James West's work. And that 
is it, it, it's a, a, a mighty tome, and it catalogues every single little bit of foxing, every tear, every annotation. I mean, in hieroglyphics that it takes you quite a long time to work. It's not a good read as a book, but it's a very good catalogue. So I had been able to go through that catalogue and go, well, apparently on page 102, there is an annotation or there's a... And sometimes I would find things that they hadn't found, that just by, by like, the, like the, the hair trapped in the, in the ink. Um, but yeah, there's, so, so I had a guide. Uh, it, so I, I call it... Um, you know, the, the, the 19th century travel guides, the, the, the bideckers. Well, I call this my bard decker. Mm. See what I did there? Very good. Very good. Um, here is, again, this is the, quite often there's really interesting evidence of female readership. And this is a copy in Sydney. And in rather beautiful 17th century copper plate handwriting, it says, Elizabeth Windybank, her book quite carefully there, at the end of Hamlet. It's a, it's a, it's a strong uh, place, but it also happens to be a spare piece of paper. I don't think she's just trying out her signature. I think she's asserting something there. A little later on, at the end of Antony and Cleopatra, somebody has also written, the unworthiest of your servants, Thomas Hurst. And the Maggie Faden, who's the librarian in Sydney, is convinced that Thomas Hurst really fancied Elizabeth Windybank <laughs> and therefore put his own little kind of signature in that too. And there are other evidence, there's evidence of that as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Here is one in Chicago, which again is Anne Park. I'm not sure that this is Anne Park writing it because it says Anne Park is. And it's written at the top of the two gentlemen of Verona. This is the point where Proteus so, for those who don't know Two Gents, Two Gents um, is a play about a guy who betrays his best friend by falling in love with his girlfriend um, and tries to snatch her away from him and leaving behind his own beloved uh, girlfriend. So, he has just confessed to the audience that Julia, his girlfriend, is that I did love. My, for now my love is thawed, which like a waxen image against the fire bears no impression of the thing it was. So somebody has written in, Anne Park is that I did love. So is that a confession? Is somebody kind of going, Proteus, I'm there with you, mate. That's exactly the place I'm in. I, I'm engaged to my girlfriend, but I don't love her anymore. I now love somebody else. So he's gone to his first folio and gone, Anne Park is... It's a confessional mode, apparently find a lot in family Bibles. People commit their secret confessional thoughts to, and, and therefore th th that's what's happening there. Who knows? We don't know. Perhaps we might say whilst we're on the page of the two gentlemen of Verona that you are living a story of the two gentlemen of Verona at the moment. And there is going to be a Greg Doran Oxford-based production just around the corner at the Oxford Playhouse in Trinity Term. Do you want to correct. speak briefly uh, correct. about that? Um, well, I was very honoured and flattered to be uh, asked to be the um, Cameron Mackintosh visiting professor this year at Oxford and uh, trying to debate what to do and knowing that other people had taken the, the professorship in different ways. I thought that the one play that in fact I, I, I have produced but never directed in the entire folio was, um, was Two Gentlemen of Verona. And it is a play about young people leaving home, moving out into the world, um, finding out their own identity, falling in love, messing up spectacularly. Um, and I thought, what better pl play to do with university students than two gentlemen of Verona? So yes, I'm gonna be doing it with the students in, in May. Yes, uh, Trinity term, week four, tickets will go fast. <laughs> Here is your last night. So, um, anybody got on their phone Google? Anybody got Google? They can just flash up for a moment. Um, so this is in a copy in the Reform Club in Pall Mall, and this is, this scene is the Clarence murder scene in Richard II. Uh, Richard III. Um, so the murderers have been sent by Richard to murder his brother. Clarence has been asleep. He wakes up and says, 
your eyes do menace me, why look you pale? Who sent you here, the wherefore do you come? And the second murderer says to, uh, to, to, and Clarence says, to murder me. And they both go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why we come. And somebody's chosen that place to sign their name. It says Janice Weston, 1774. Now, have you got your phone out? Could you just look up Janice Weston? I said to the, the Reform Club guy, the librarian, who was Janice Weston? And what happened to her in 1774? And why would she write her name against, why have you come to murder me? Why would you write it there? So I, they don't know. I go home and I Google Janice Weston. Can you look, can you stand up and just say, if you found it, What's the first item that comes up under Janice Weston? Janice Weston say, say again. Murder. Yeah, go on. Say. Janice Weston murder, 1883. Janice Weston, A. Janice Weston was murdered in a lay-by outside Cambridge in 1983. Janice Weston signs her name next to wilt thou murder me in 1774. I cannot do anything with that. <laughs> if anybody wants to write a novel, there's your starting point. That's actually a great so, um, At the time, Janice Weston was just a woman. At this point, we are going to open it to the floor for questions. We may intervene ourselves occasionally, but that if anyone has a question for Greg Doran, <laughs> Dame Janet Suzman has a question with you, Dame Janet. of correlation, and you said something fascinating about the stage directions when they look at their hands. Can you recall that? Yes. Uh, so uh, Janet's asking, Janet, um, I was very, very lucky to have Janet Sussman play Volumnia in a production of Coriolanus I did in Stratford, um, which was the last play uh, before the old RST was torn down and the new one uh, was built. Um, and at the, there were two great moments that I remember specifically, one of which is where the most eloquent moment, in a way, is where Volumnia goes to persuade Coriolanus not to side with the enemy, but to come back to Rome, knowing that actually this is going to kill him. This is going to be his death warrant. And she persuades him in one of the longest speeches in Shakespeare, um, and there is a silence. A silence, not just a pause that you know from the text because of the way the shared line works and the way the, way the, way the beat is distributed. It's a, it's, a, it's a silent pause. And it's one of the most electric moments in Shakespeare. And um, after which Coriolanus says, oh mother, mother, what hast thou done? And I, I remember I have a copy of Shakespeare um, which, like the Robin Island Shakespeare, I have asked people to sign over the years. And Janet signed that pause because it was one of the most electric things in the, in the play. Do you know that there's a stage direction written in it? <coughs> and so, so much that Shakespeare was busily ordering suites because he left the stage direction so that the company would obey his talent. Ah, yes. And he was asked to sign. Yes, that's good. That, indeed, right. But you, the other moment I'm just going to recall um, is there is a beat where Volumnia then comes back to Rome. And um, Volumnia, who is never short of a word, uh, is brought in front of the... the, the and the, Rome is uh, shouting her praises. And um, she just turns on her heel and, and leaves. And I remember the rehearsal where... Um, Janet and I were talking about this, talking about why, does, why isn't there a big speech where she says, I have returned and Coriolanus will return home. Um, and realized that she just simply can't do that speech. So what Janet did brilliantly was to start as if she was there, the crowd went silent, expecting her to speak, and she could not speak and turned on her and, and, and left. It was one of the most electric um, moments in, in theatre, and it, it's not there in Shakespeare, except that we were interpreting what she doesn't say as well as what she does. 
So thank you for that performance, Dermot. <laughs> yes, I can't remember that. Can we get another question? Can no, we? No, 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 I can't. Yeah. We are going to have a look after this, Dermot. We're going to look in that and find out. He takes her hand. He takes her hand, correct. Is the station. Yes, Simon. You said it was Peter Fagel. Yes. Maybe you've made that up. <laughs> <laughs> I do that a lot. <laughs> I suspect that you might have. But it was a fascinating incorporation of you. That it was written into the program just in case the actors got it wrong. Ah. Yes, well that, it's, a, it's one of the stage directions. It's very interesting when there are stage directions and whether, whether they have put in stage directions, whether the, 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 the compositors, whether the, you know, the, 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 the scribes have put in stage directions too. So that's very interesting. There is um, the, the very first play in the folio is The Tempest, which of course was actually one of the last plays that Shakespeare wrote. And that um, Greg, Greg has been speaking about how m messy and uh, inattentive some of the compositing was, in particular from this, this young apprentice who couldn't really concentrate and took, took him many goes to get some things right. But it looks like that the first play in the folio is the one on which they lavished most attention as the kind of showcase piece. So if you were browsing thinking, should you or should you not spend 44 loaves worth of money on the, on the volume, you would be super impressed by the, by the first play in the volume. But it also looks like the stage directions don't really emerge from stage practice, and that they are a sort of slightly literary version of stage directions, which includes curious stage directions like they vanish to a hollow, confused so, noise, yes. or something where you go, mm, okay, let's now vanish to a hollow, hollow confused <laughs> noise. That actually, they're quite difficult to materially deliver, but it makes for a great reading experience. One of those, that one of the things you realize is that uh, in the quartos, there are very, very few uh, scene divisions, and certainly very few act divisions. And in the folio, in the Tempest, they have inserted classical sort of act divisions. So there's a moment when they put in act five, and it really sort of, not only like a scene change, a scene division, it's an act division, so you kind of take notice of it. But it's the moment when Prospero, having uh, created the mask for uh, Miranda and Ferdinand, uh, has now got to deal with Caliban and the clowns, and he sets the dogs on them and then sort of uses that whole um, energy, if you like, um, to uh, focus on the, the lords, which is the next uh, part of his attention. And I remember in rehearsal a sense of how that drive, that momentum that's built up, is arrested because there's a scene change. Mm -hmm. And we realized that, that that shouldn't be there, that scene change and that he should just drive straight through and take all the momentum and the hatred and the anger that he's poured into attacking these poor souls with dogs. And now, the vengeance that he has been longing for all those years, he can, he can shape on the, on, on the lords. Um, at, of course, which is then arrested by Ariel, who in that production was played by Mark Courtley, who some of you are going to see later on, if you're lucky. Um, and Ariel arrests that anger by, by saying, or you could try forgiveness. The rarer action is in virtue than in vengeance. Um, and without, with the stage direction, that momentum was lost. So that's one of the things that I'm wary about looking at the folio is, is, the, is the imposition of those. those. So, but and one of the things that that, that imposition of an act five kind of restart moment. Yeah. So the opening line of act five of The Tempest is, now does my project gather to a head. head and time goes upright. And that idea of a project that is gathering to a head is also this very potent metaphor. Of what happens to things that gather to a head? Yeah. They have a certain kind of tension that, that feels like it's gonna need to erupt or release at some cathartic something at some point. And the generic indeterminacy of the play is partly fixed 
by locating that moment as on, the, on a boundary of yeah. something. We know about plays where a brother betrays a brother. We know Hamlet. Is it going to end in a, you know, are they all going to be dead on the, the stage? Yeah. Or are they going to be able to navigate it through to some sort of redemption? And then there is that aerial intervention. And of course, it could be that they were performing in the Black Friars and the candle wicks needed changing. So they had to put in an artificial break, which then we don't need. We can, we, we can retain that, that momentum. Um, the, the, in the same way, the folio also, in terms of actors going back to the folio, as you were saying there, uh, Darcy, was the sense that when I was doing The Taming of the Shrew, um, there is a stage direction at the end of the first encounter between Kate and Petruchio, uh, that wonderful, extraordinary um, battle between them. Suddenly, we had charted through the scene, looking at where um, Petruchio always call, sort of constantly calls her the and thou, and she resolutely says you, except for one point. And there's clear, you can map the, the kind of temperature of the scene through those these and thous and yous. The audience can't pick it up because we don't use the and thou anymore, but the actors can. And we reached a point where suddenly he, they seem to be on a kind of plateau of understanding, and then suddenly, he shifts and goes, for I am he and born to tame you, Kate, and turn you from a, a Kate conformable to a Kate conformable, whatever the line is. Um, and we kind of, it took ages kind of going, why has he suddenly flipped? In the folio, there is a stage direction which is enter Baptista, i.e. enter Kate's father, just as he then turns, flips and says, for I am he and born to tame you, Kate. Every editor since Alexander Pope has thought, oh, well, that must come at the end of his speech. They can't come in in the middle of the speech, can they? Mm -hmm. So they've moved it to the end of the speech. And until we did that production, every editor... So now, I'm glad to say, the Arden edition now has shifted and put that stage direction back. But thank you, Folio, and thank you, the analysis that the actors were... Because it wasn't my, 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 my discovery. It was the actors had gone home, looked at the Folio, and found the solution to what we were asking. So... Another question from the floor. Um, second row over here, Guy Stokes, please. Yeah, I'll come back in a moment. Can you bring me? Oh, a, oh sorry, I beg your pardon. Guy, we're, yeah, we're going to come back to you. There's somebody queued up to go right now. Thank you, Hannah. Gentleman uh, at the back. Hello, thank you very much, um, Judith and Gregory. It's been fascinating this evening and very inspiring. So much so that I've uh, promised myself when I go home tonight, I won't be playing PlayStation. I'll be returning to the scripts that I'm working on. So thank you. <laughs> um, my first uh, question. Um, one of my students who's present this evening has been tasked with uh, adapting a piece of text uh, for the stage um, in her sixth form. Gregory, I was wondering if you could share some insight and some tips for her when she comes to, uh, to adapting this piece for stage. Um, my second question, if I can be so cheeky, um, as an educator for 15 years, I've never met one student who has enthusiastically um, welcomed studying Shakespeare. It's always met with a sigh. Um, how, as an educator, do or as educators, do we keep the legacy of Shakespeare relevant and exciting for younger generations? Get them to do it on their feet. Okay. Get them to stand up and do it, and don't worry about not understanding what thee or thou means. Just get get you know don't 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 worry too much about analysing it at that stage. Just engage them with the excitement of not only working through language but actually having it in their mouths. There's a fantastic line by um, the guy who wrote Angela Zassi's. Yes! Can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Frank McCourt, thank you very much. He was uh, in hospital as a young man, a young boy. Um, long disease, long, long hours, long time in hospital. And the only thing he had to read was Shakespeare. And he said, reading Shakespeare was like reading it out loud was like having jewels in your mouth. And I think young people respond to actually saying it out loud and then kind of getting up and being a witch, you know, or being, you know, being Henry V, I don't know. Um, and I, I, I think it's, we spend a lot of time at the ROC of engaging teachers with the rehearsal room techniques that we have. 
which are, you know, we do analyze the text a lot, but we stand on our feet and, 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 and do it. And I think I'm going to have to ask you, uh, answer your other question privately because I need some more time to think about that. ask the critics that. Um, it's a question about casting and whether there's any technique to it. Um, I know that um, I know that with the Shakespeare plays, there are some that you can go into a casting process and a revision process with an absolutely open mind, and there are some that you have to go, I'm not doing King Lear unless I know who's playing King Lear. I'm not going to do Hamlet until somehow that has, that, that has... I think I asked Janet to play Volumnia about three years in advance of us actually doing it, and I was very lucky that she said yes, um, because I knew that if I had that in place, that other things would fall into place around it. And also, you were going to raise the bar by, do it, by doing that. I knew when David Tennant agreed to play Hamlet and Patrick Stewart agreed to play Claudius that everything else kind of would come into place beyond that. John Barton, the great John Barton, um, the, the, the great director and, and teacher at Stratford for many years, uh, he once said to me, don't worry about Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. They will basically sort out themselves. Worry about Caithness and Menteith and Lennox, because they're going to really struggle knowing what to do. And I find that is really important. To me, casting is... Is, is, is one of the three big things I do before I go into rehearsal, along with cutting the play and having the play designed. Um, and as Tyron Guthrie once said, 80% good directing is good casting. So you're, if you're very lucky if you get... Because you want... Adrian Noble once said to me, cast people who are better than you are. You know, cast up. Don't just cast your mates. Because you won't get better that way. You won't grow that way. You won't learn that way. And that's one of the glories of working at Stratford. For me, I've been very lucky um, to be able to, to, to have a pool of huge talents that have come through that company to draw upon. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I usually know, if anybody's thinking of auditioning, I, I know that when I've sort of, I can quite, quite often know when the person walks through the door whether they can do it or not, and d never do a sp don't never do a, an audition speech that's too long because I've decided in the first two lines whether you can act or not. I'm pretty certain of it, and um, you know it's it's clear. Um, so yeah, I, I, I have te te I have then you also have diplomatic techniques um, to as to how you're going to get through the rest of the audition when you know they're not right. Um, but yeah, I won't tell you about those. We have a Thank you. Um, how did Shakespeare acquire his wide and deep knowledge of history? How did Shakespeare say again? Acquire his deep and wide knowledge of I, history. I think he was just a voracious reader. And I think um, w we know that, uh, we don't know about his library so much. We know more about Ben Jonson's library, oddly. Um, and Ben Jonson used to sign his books as well. He used to say Ben Jonson's book. Um, uh, Explorator, I think he was. So he was a curious mind, and I think he had access. If you think about it, the great hub of, of the London and indeed the, the British book trade was just down the road from him uh, uh, in the, the north corner, the, the northwest, the northeast corner of the northeast corner of, of St Paul's Churchyard. That was the centre of the book trade. Um, all the stationers had their stations there, and they were all selling different stuff. Um, and I think he, he absorbed those. I think he kind of read through. He clearly knew Plutarch. He clearly knew... I, I don't think his classical um, um, knowledge was as great as Ben Jonson's, but in a way, so what? The problem often with Ben Jonson is you see his research showing. <laughs> um, and with, ben, with Shakespeare, you never do. It always starts with the character and the, and the, and the, the relationships. And then... In the con Antony and Cleopatra is about uh, 
two uh, older people in love with each other, and the, the, they're in a kind of bubble, and the rest of the world, the, the geopolitics of what's happening around it, breaks through that bubble. But what Shakespeare starts with is what are those, how do those two people express their love for each other, I think. have a university education and it was thought uh, he, he kind of took cheap shots from, from his contemporaries but that one of the things we see repeatedly in his work is the way in which he invites history to engage with the present yeah. and that actually we even saw that in that tiny little bit about the antique senators of Rome and then the gracious empress and her um, general being sent to Ireland that, that kind of overlay of the present on some historical precedent and finding something interesting through the encounter between those two things. And we also know that Shakespeare was reading with the literati circles of London in a very up-to-date way. So, for example, in The Tempest, uh, he is quoting from unpublished material of letters that have come back from the Bermudas about a shipwreck. And that he quotes something, it is going to be published, but it is not yet published at the point at which he's writing reference to that into the, the Tempest. And so we know that he was among that circle of people who passed around unpublished literary material and knew that there were enough others in that circle that it was worth referencing it so that some other people could get the illusion as well. So if we are scoffing at his little Latin and That's less Greek... <laughs> Greek that doesn't necessarily mean none either, and that a grammar school education in the 16th century was actually pretty classically demanding. And we see him using Latin from, its, from the original Latin, and we see him using Latin in, in Golding translations or in and other translations as well, which would have had a very kind of quick recognition value for other people who, were, who had read it in translation. And, and we know that... that as a schoolboy in Stratford, he, was, he would have been tasked to write in Latin a speech in the first person where Brutus defends the assassination of Caesar. So he started his, A, his kind of thinking about how, how does a character speak and articulate something, right the way back at school and using all the, all the stuff he's learned about rhetoric and the way that language can persuade people. So, from that point of view, he sort of imbued it from that classical ed grammar school education, I think. But also uses kind of slightly popular historical sources to play to a narrative that people would slightly know. So through Holland shares and things, that, that this was very widely known. So he starts telling a story back to people through terms in which they're going to recognize it. And then you do something interesting or deepening at the same time. You've got an audience. One more, we'll take one more, one more question. Uh, right at the back, please. Thank you. Hang on, there's a microphone. If you could just, there's a microphone coming. It's, it's on its way. Hey, thank you. Um, which is your favourite play and why? <laughs> you know, people always ask me that. I usually say it's the play I'm doing now. So my favourite play is Two Gentlemen of Verona. <laughs> uh, and with that, I think we should close. Um, I'll stand, stand up. It has been such a pleasure to have you with us this afternoon, Greg. It, it's a, a, an extraordinarily distinguished guest. And um, you have animated our world, well, my world for decades. And it's wonderful to have you here in person as well. Please can we thank Greg Doran. Thank you.